If I'm still alive, I will come back. You know? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Fine. Fine. Thank you. That's good. Bad. Oh, that's great. I wish only you were that close. Freddie's voice can be heard. Freddie had an amazing voice. He could do just about anything. He could do the sweetest. He could do deep, powerful. Love of my life, don't leave me. You've stolen my love, you're not deserving. It's such a great star, Bubbler. Such a great star. Nobody can replace Freddie Mercury. That's a monster, monster fate. An incredible depth, a, a real richness of voice. Most people look at Freddie and say it's probably the greatest voice to ever come out of rock and roll and probably a fair uh, description. Freddie Mercury was showbiz bubbler. He should have been in pantomime, really, you know, as one of the ugly sisters or, you know, and boy, you were ugly, Freddie. I loved you, but you were ugly. Renowned as one of the greatest performers of the 20th century, Freddie Mercury pushed the boundaries of art and music as he spearheaded Queen, one of the greatest bands in music and rock history. His limitless vocal power and extravagant stage performances shocked and wowed audiences around the world. But out of the spotlight, he was intensely private. His tragic death at the age of 45 left an empty spotlight that will never be filled. This is the story of Freddie Mercury, and how a shy boy from Zanzibar took to the stage and became one of the most iconic figures in modern history. You have a very extrovert stage act by any standards. Will you be able to go on with... You mean I flaunt it? You're over the top. <laughs> with one of the most recognisable voices ever. I've always been intrigued by show business artists who become their own image. One of the great examples of that is Brian Ferry, of course, who came from the northeast of England. He came from poverty, and uh, with Roxy, he went through various images. It was very exciting, a different image every year. And then he settled on the English gentleman look. And he became an English gentleman. And indeed, he was honored in the Queen's birthday honors list um, in 2011. That's a great example of someone becoming their own image. Well, Freddie is one of the greatest cases of reinvention of image there's ever been in show business. Very few people who were Freddie Mercury fans know he was Farrakh Bulsara. And indeed, if you bear in mind that I got to know him in 1974, I never heard anybody call him Farrakh. It's rather like Elton John, you didn't call him Reg. Once he decided he wanted to be Elton, you called him Reg at your peril. And uh, Farrakh wanted to be called Freddie. Within music, everyone was calling him Freddie. By the time I met him, he was definitely Freddie. And in fact, it was some time before I realized that what his original name was, because he still had a passport in his birth name. Um, but he lived, he lived his character. He was Freddie Mercury, and uh, that was all he wanted to be. I'm sure most people who are Queen fans would just assume he'd been born in England, but in fact, he was born in Zanzibar. His parents had come from India. Young Farrakh was sent to St. Peter's English Boarding School in Panjgani, India, in 1954, at the age of eight. It was here that his classmates nicknamed him Freddie. As well as being a good sportsman, he was incredibly artistic. He had begun taking piano lessons at the age of seven and continued to pursue music and the arts throughout his youth. If you're taking in music, if you're playing music as a child, it's second nature to you when you're an adult. But also, 
even if you're not performing it as an adult, it gives you insights as to what the performers are doing. You can hear music like a conductor hears music. You can hear everything that's going on. And you can sing, in the case of Freddie Mercury, with your voice as an instrument. I feel alive. They'd only gone to Zanzibar so that his father could continue his job with the British government. They were Zoroastrians, and I know that uh, to many Zoroastrians, it is a matter of great pride that uh, Freddie Mercury is their great rock star. When Zanzibar won its independence, they then moved to England. In 1966, Freddie began a graphic illustrating course at the Ealing College of Art in London. He became good friends with classmate Tom Staffel. Staffel was the lead singer in a local band named Smile. When Freddie attended their rehearsal, he met the guitarist, Brian May, and drummer, Roger Taylor. It is very interesting that Freddie pursued the group like a suitor goes after a potential lover. He thought he belonged in this group, or this group belonged with him, whichever way you want to look at it. Made himself immediately known when Tim Staffel dropped out. That was a big mistake. In 1970, when Freddie joined Smile, he suggested they change their name to Queen, and he himself changed his last name to Mercury. I've known several people who have aspired to show business careers who want to eliminate some aspect of their ethnicity. You could even say this was true of ABBA, for example. Bjorn and Benny knew that if they were going to break out of Sweden, they had to sing in English because English was the international language of rock and roll. Freddie, being interested in music from an early age, would have known that there had never been a pop star called Farrakh. When you think that Freddie persuaded Brian and Roger to rename Smile Queen, taking it up a level of both audaciousness um, <laughs> and uh, status. So similarly, changing your name from Balsara to Mercury, well, you're choosing the name of one of the gods. So you are elevating yourself in terms of your image, at least. And uh, this, this is an amazing case of uh, personal reinvention, but it worked. By the time I met Freddie, he was living in central London, in this Kensington area. And he didn't talk much about his past. He wasn't for one second ashamed of it, but I think he just had moved on. But I know he was very fond of his family, and I suspect he was lovely to them. Um, from time to time, he would talk about living abroad and the influences. But I think he grew up very quickly, especially when they had their first hit. And he was already very confident most of the time. And I just feel that he, he just embraced the whole thing with the music business and being a star. Although he was quite often quiet and shy and would sit quietly in one corner. Shirley Bassey, a girl from Tiger Bay in Wales. Who would ever expect a girl from Tiger Bay in Wales to become an international diva? But Shirley Bassey did it. And she had this panache and this... Uh, the style, which was uh, almost unprecedented. In show business, you learn very quickly, or else you just stop doing it. The people accept you on the way that you present them. Now, you can't then just say, oh, but I'm not really like that. It's the only way they know. But that's liberating and it gives you opportunity because they will only know what you give them. So you can be from Zanzibar, you can have bad teeth, but if you give them dignity and power, 
they will treat you as a dignified and powerful person. It's the one way in which he takes the band with him. They couldn't have known when they added him as the singer that he was going to turn out that way because nobody had had that sense of theatricality in rock. A thing that everybody, I suppose, is going to be wondering about uh, the uh, the campness of the act. Uh, that was one of the things I read in the pop press in England that the act was a little bit camp. And it's all this not. Stuff. I, I it's not really camp. You know, it's mm. rock and roll, and it's 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 very visual as well. Mm. Um, mm. There's a lot of rock and roll music there. Yeah. And I think it's it's the same as uh, the variety content that we have on the album. We try and put that across on stage. So I mean, each song that we do has a different sort of uh, meaning to it. So I mean, you know, it is rock and roll as a sort of label. But within that, I mean, each song has a different... Uh, Would you say it was rock and roll feel. with theatre? Yes, you could call it that. Mm, I mean, it's, of, it's yeah. very difficult to label, but each song is, is in a different sort of category, really. I mean, from the 1920s vaudeville to the, mm. to the heavy, the real sort of raw rock and roll to the ballad to, you know. We told that there was a really good band playing at Imperial College, and I went along with some of my friends from EMI and one or two other people not really knowing what to expect. Um, this would have been November 1973. And I was absolutely blown away. I, I don't think I've ever seen a new band play like that. The place was absolutely packed. You can see it's this microscopic stage and Fred is performing like he's already in a stadium. I mean, he's big, he projected big. In the early days, there was a tradition that they always wore black and white on stage. And Freddie would be incredibly um, careful. Everything matched, everything fitted. He would have black and white painted fingernails. And he loved what was always referred to as Freddie's frocks. And he would come out and the most amazing things. Um, Zandra Rhodes designed some for him in the early days. Um, one with wings like an angel. And it was a long time before they changed that. Uh, for a very long time, they, it was always black and white. The others weren't quite as flamboyant, but that was their theme. Um, off stage, Freddie was always very exotic um, and always wore wonderful silks and satins, as did he and Roger in the early days, because as I said, they, they had basically were wearing stuff that was stock in the, the store they'd had. And even in later years, he became very influenced by um, oriental clothing. He loved Japanese things. And as you say, he loved opera. He just liked anything that was grand and exotic, but it had to be good. It had to be nice material. It had to be right, and everything had to be perfect. I had a very dear friend of mine in, in the business, a very famous club called Speakeasy Club in Margaret Street in the West End of London, and Gloria O'Leary. He said, Eric, there's a band been playing here or been there or whatever they were doing. He said, great band called Queen. You should come and see them. I always love to see new talent. And I went to see him. I think maybe the Marquee Club or one of those clubs. And I fell in love with him. I thought, these guys are going to be big, monster big. But more Freddie, not knocking Brian May, my monster mate, and Roger Taylor, who I love, and John Deacon. Well, I don't love John, I just half a kiss John. Even in those early days, Freddie stood out. He stood out for me. He was the star. He was the, you know, he loved it. I don't know. I think it's the old word, charisma. You know, you can have a milkman that has charisma, or a milkman that have charisma. He just, he just stood there with these guys around him. Roger, Brian, John. He was the star of the show. He always stood out. He had that magic, that sparkle. They had really quite a sophisticated stage show. They really worked the audience. And, I mean, we all just stood there with our mouths open and were just stunned. In 1971, John Deacon joined the group as the bass player. Producers John Anthony and Roy Thomas Baker from London Trident Studios signed a management contract with the band and they began work on their first album. But they needed a record label. Well, basically the way it happened was that Jack Nelson, their manager, from, who was representing the, the band and the album on behalf of Trident Studios, who owned it, uh, came to EMI, both the, the record company side and the music publishing side, and, and offered it to uh, Roy Featherston, who was my boss. He was the general manager of the pop division. Uh, and basically, we got a set of copy tapes, and uh, Roy played it, thought it sounded interesting, got me and 
the EMI label manager at that time, Dave Croker, and we listened to it. And we actually weren't quite sure what to make of it because it, it, it fell between a lot of things that were going on at that time because there was obviously the, the very much the prog rock thing happening. There was the, 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 the burgeoning glam rock thing uh, and they sat somewhere rather uh, oddly in the middle of somewhere, I guess, in where we wanted to be in that Roxy Music niche. A few weeks later, after this shtick, I get a call from Uncle Roy Featherstone, who was the chairman of EMI Records. Eric, Eric, he says to me, because he used to say every twice, I think I got my monster monster from him. Eric, Eric, want to see you, want to see you. Got to see you, got to see you. And he said, Eric, we're starting a new label here at EMI. The EMI label, so we got the EMI, no, no. We got Columbia, we got Parlophone, we got Regal's owner phone, we got Harvest, we got Schmarvis. We want one label, EMI label, where all the acts, new acts, and some of our old acts like Cliff Richard and Silla Black, and whoever it might be, will all be on the EMI label, just one label. We still have the other labels, but maybe specialist type shticks. So we'd like you to run it. Very simple, five minutes over lunch. He said, want you to add a promotion. The group I saw the other week, right, the Queen. They're called the Queen. I said, they're sensational. And I know, I believe from my little sh people, I know that you are thinking about signing them. EMI signed Queen and released their first self-titled album on the 13th July, 1973. In those days, you didn't necessarily have great expectations of the first album. Uh, and quite often, if you had a hit off the first album, the, the, it, it kind of skewed the process. Uh, and we, uh, we released Keep Your Soul Alive off the first album. And the album went OK. Uh, and by, I guess, three or four months into it, uh, we'd made a modest impact because uh, by that time, the... Imperial College gig had happened and the first press started uh, and it was just a, a little whisper building. The word Queen was definitely not a rock and roll name, but Freddie would have known intuitively that he was not just a rock and roll singer. He already knew that he liked Shirley Bassey and Liza Minnelli and uh, whether that was something he was willing to let the others discover in time, he would have thought that this band is going to be more than only rock and roll. Not that there was anything wrong with rock and roll, not that they weren't going to try to be the best at rock and roll, but there could be added value. My first encounter with them was uh, a difficult one because as the marketing manager, it was my job to get the album out on the market. And literally the entire band came in one afternoon with the artwork and I would made an appointment with uh, our creative services manager, who was a difficult character. The artwork was their artwork, they had done it, and the, in, in particular, the Queen logo was Freddie's pride and joy. He'd done all that kind of filigree silver artwork, and uh, the creative services guy, Ron, looked at it under the desk, and he said, I can't do anything with that, it's rubbish. And, and, and of course, the, the Freddie and all the band started to bristle, and my job really was to, was to referee this encounter. Freddie's Queen logo embodied the regal aspirations he had for the group. It featured the zodiacs of all four band members, two lions for Roger and John, a crab for Brian, and two fairies for Freddie. I think in some ways, um... The, the name didn't do them any favours in the early days because it had obvious connotations. People thought they were something they weren't. But there was always this regal kind of feel to them. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain. And, of course, the crest that they still use to this day was something that was designed um, between them. And I never really found out exactly where the idea came from. But by the time I knew them, they were already queen having been smile before, they'd come for something completely different. And for some reason, it just suited them. I always got the impression that Freddie was the driving force. He was the one who, in the end, they would defer to. If he felt strongly enough about it, he could get them to go along with it. But they 
seemed to be a unit, and I think that was very important to them in the discussion. Freddie, I learned there and then, he had um, named the band, which made sense, and um, of course he was, at that point in time, emphasising the regal factor. So I remember asking him about it, well, because we're very regal, Mick. And he had done the logo, he had done the logo and the lettering. But it was, you know, it was a democratic thing, but where you could see Freddie was, was a little more sophisticated than the others about uh, things visual. Uh, but they were very charming, I mean, and they were very bright. Anyone looking back at the early years of Queen have to understand the context of the time. Being in a group was like participating in the social network of that time. This is before the internet, so there were none of the social networks. And the way that young people related to each other and communicated was through music. And you expressed your views through the type of music you liked, through the earnest and excited communications you had with your friends about the latest records. The DJs on the radio were the human incarnations of Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. And the music had a role in society. Queen and Freddie's writing in particular was very different from other people in that he could explore so many different avenues. Uh, and I, all, I never really understood where that came from. I uh, appreciate he had you know, quite a cosmopolitan background, but uh, the fact that he could relatively early in his career write something like Killer Queen, which is actually really an unusual record. It didn't, it didn't fit what was going on at the time. You couldn't put it alongside you know, other comparable bands like Roxy Music or whatever and say, well, that's kind of that sort of thing. It was just a unique record. I think it was very interesting talking to them, especially in the early days when they had time to talk about their influences. I remember there was a, a painting that Freddie particularly liked, which was called The Fairy Fellow's Masterstroke. And some of the visuals, some of the things, I think, were like that. He also, if I remember rightly, liked Mukha and, and those beautiful, the, the seasonal pictures. There was a lot of, I mean, Freddie had done an art degree, so he was much closer to that kind of thing than the others. In March 1974, they released their second album, Queen 2. The second single was Seven Seas of Rye, which, thank God, got months to months to play because I laid, it's like building a house, I laid the foundation, then you put the bricks on. So the foundation really was keep yourself alive. Enough to, that foundation was strong, monster strong, enough to, seven seas of rye comes out, and then it took off. If you can simplify it but by saying it was the contrast between Freddie's theatricality and Brian's hard guitar work, uh, that contrast hadn't become fully developed yet. You know, no one really knew who they were, but Freddie knew who they were, that's for sure. He was very, very confident. I think Freddie always really wanted to give a show. I think in some ways a lot of his life was a show. He always wanted to look amazing, he always wanted to, and he loved the fans. He was a thorough, he was a really nice guy. And he loved the fans, as did all the others, and appreciated them coming and spending their money, and wanted to give them something to remember. Queen come along as a self-contained band who musically, great drummer, world-class drummer, great guitarist, Great bass guitarist, lead guitarist, and a great, great singer, which he had. He sung from here, here, his heart, and here, of course. But great, that's what I mean. Their talent. Killer Queen, to me, is the first of the classic Queen tracks. She keeps them always in a pretty cabinet, with 
she says, just like Marie Antoinette, a building a remedy for Chris John and Kennedy. Here, Freddie has found his lyrical mode. She's a killer, clean, gun body, gelatine. So many parts of that song are just so clever. And then at the appropriate moments, there's the contrast with Brian's ferocious guitar. This is it. They've also incorporated the high harmonies of Roger. And uh, I thought, this is like a new group. And this was the song that broke them in America. And it was their biggest hit in Britain. Is this the real life? When we got Bohemian Rhapsody, we were concerned. Everyone was in shock. Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. It was crazy. Open your eyes, look up to the skies and see. What earth do they think they're doing? It's so long, it's so it's three records in one. And they never heard anything like it. I'm just a fool. You can't call it just a song. You can't call it something as grand as an opera. It's a piece. It's a mini opera. I was the idiot who said, why, why don't we ask them to do an edit? And the, uh, the response was a, a couple of words. And of course, the rest is history. Still don't understand it. Still don't understand it. Mama just killed a man, put a gun against his head, pulled the trigger. Now I said, I'm listening to it. I said, lovely, love, pulled the trigger, very sad. Got a hoosh, got a schmooch, got a hoosh. No, no way. I said to Freddie, Freddie, I love it. Not going to get it played because we've got no chance. It's like nine, ten minutes long originally. No way. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, scaramouche, will you do the fandango? The person who thought it would be a hit was Kenny Everett who was working on Capitol Radio at the time. And it is true that he played it many times. Radio One's Record of the Week, and now Power Play and Luxembourg, which was very strong with those, those monster, monster strong. And was getting, I suppose Power Play meant something like 10 plays a night, which a hell of a lot of plays in one week, like 70 plays. I found out the factory, we found the factory of the morning. If you got the figures from the night before, Ian My Hayes. Hello, Bobby Eric here. So and so, how did we do? So and so, record day, da 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 da. Queen Baby Rhapsody, 60. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. My biggest fear has come true. The kids now are not buying it anymore because it's too long. It's too long. 60. I knew it. I knew it. 60. I can't be sure. Eric, 60,000. <laughs> 60,000. And all the records I've promoted, from Cillaback to Sex Pistols to Schmiftels and Elton John, Blue, the group Blue, the original Blue, all those, I've never had a record sell that much. It was then 60,000, 80,000, I think the biggest daily figure. I mean, you do 80,000 now, you'd be number one for 12 weeks. In those days, we was just, and I think the biggest figure, daily figure we had on Queen probably went to about one day, 130,000. The record went to number one for nine weeks. I get a call from Freddie from Japan. He's in Japan. Eric, my dear, it's that Freddie. Listen, uh, got all those all the time for the video. Have you got them yet? I said, yes, it was me given to so and so. Who's given to you? No, 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 no. We're not doing Mike Manford, my dear. We're not me, my boobla, boobla, boobla. We're not doing that boobla, Mike Manford. We're using Bruce Gow. I said, no, you're not. I got a deal with Mike Manford. Contracted. He does all any of my videos from Living Newton John to Cliff Richard to whoever, Shmera, whoever, any, any, you know. I can't do that. No, 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 no. <clears throat> no. I paid about four hundred pound a video, or maybe five hundred. We was using ITN Studios in London, Central London, a little you know, where they make the news. And we used to go there two or three hours a week while they weren't doing the news shtick and do a little, you know, 
one camera job, you four or five hundred pound, you bite your arm off. <clears throat> no, Freddie's not on. We ain't gonna use, you gotta use, but who you got? And you, oh, we've had a meeting, without me being there, how dare you have a meeting with me there about my, my budget, my money, not personally my money, but the, you know, my budget. He said, anyway, we've had a meeting and we're gonna use Ruth Cowles and it's gonna cost about four or five maybe at the most. Well, okay, it's a similar price to Mike Bass, four or five hundred, but I still don't want to use him. No, four or five thousand. I think four or five thousand, are you mad? We can make God with a win too for four or five thousand in those days. Oh, mamma mia, mamma mia. Mamma mia, let me go. Beelzebub has a devil put aside for me, for me, for me. I don't think there was ever a disagreement because... Nobody ever asked our opinion and didn't need to. Freddie said to me, oh, we made a short film yesterday afternoon with Bruce Gowers. And, of course, the reason they'd made it was because they couldn't do it on top of the pops because they couldn't do that many overdubs, they couldn't do the, the, the segues of styles and so forth. So, uh, but to be on top of the pops, they wanted to give them this clip, so they made a short film. Well, that short film happened to revolutionize the way that music is consumed because neither uh, MTV or VH1 would exist had it not been for that short film. The whole thing was quite extraordinary. And again, I, I think people weren't quite sure how to take it, but once they saw it, they realized just how good it was. The point about Freddie was that he, he was, you know, he, he obviously had some strand of eccentricity about, uh, about his lyric writing and, and his, some uh, very left field things. I mean, the, the music itself was, was so bizarre that you, uh, you had no idea what the lyrics meant and, and really, who cared? I think one of the interesting things about Queen is that their songs wrote into such interpretation. But I'm not going to say on camera who I think it's about. <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody was basically I was writing three songs um, and they were meant to be different and I just... Uh, they, I just couldn't finish them and I just thought, oh, damn it, I just put the three together. just about do all our own production. We have uh, Roy Baker, who sort of uh, co-produces with us, and all, all the four albums have been a co-production uh, with him. Do, do you feel that uh, Night at the Opera is perhaps uh, you're reaching now, you've reached a climax at a certain stage in your career, because I, I believe it's definitely the best that you've ever done. Mm. <coughs> Thanks. Yes. I think it's possibly the peak so far, because it's the most successful, but I mean, we hope <laughs> we're going to get better. better. We do have a different peak. It is, it, it is going to be difficult, especially with uh, Bohemian Rhapsody being um, as large. Oh, well, a kid wrote me a letter about that and said, I study demonology and oh, satanic yeah. things. Why do they use Beelzebub? <laughs> and, that, which, oh, and I suppose that's a legitimate question. <laughs> why do we use it? Yeah. It's just a... I mean, why do we use anything? I mean, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I study demonology and things. I just love the, <laughs> the word Beelzebub. <laughs> great word, isn't it? Very can't we to leave it. Uh, actually, the letter was signed with the cloven hoof at the top. Oh. Uh, what is that? Oh. The what same is the... sect. <laughs> I belong to that. <laughs> sticking pins in effigies. So... <laughs> the Ooh, next single that's coming off night at the opera is You're My Best Friend, I understand. And uh, already we're getting a lot of requests for that. But it, it's entirely different in structure uh, to Bohemian Rhapsody, isn't it? and that's what makes the mm. album attractive yeah. to me. Is it this right? is John's song. Yeah. John, yeah. John Rutherford. Yes, because, uh, I mean, that's probably one thing in the group that we all do right, which lends to the variety of our albums, mm. you know. Mm. It's a very good thing, I think. Yeah. Mm. There, there have been several songs on uh, your albums that have been involved with death and all this sort of stuff. Is that just an accidental thing, or...? That's Freddie's morbid mind, then. <laughs> <laughs> one of my docile moods, actually. Yeah. In the early days of pop and the music, the two greatest stars were Enrico Caruso and Al Jolson. And that is because both of them could be heard in every corner of the theater without amplification, because they were working before amplification. Da, da, da. Don't cry, goody. don't cry. Ah. Goodbye, goody. I gotta buy. Freddie's voice can be heard. He 
would walk out on stage and he could control the audience immediately. There was something about him, and of course, especially a little while later, a lot of their songs were anthems in, in a way. I don't think I ever met anybody who came out of a Queen concert disappointed. Now, perhaps I'm biased, because I suppose in a way I became a fan. I tried to be objective, it's kind of hard. I think that they just wanted to do the best they possibly could for as much of the time as they possibly could, and I think they achieved that. And the ever self-effacing Freddie Mercury made his familiar, timid entrance. When you saw Freddie at peak, certainly this was true at Live Aid, you actually found yourself thinking, thank God he's using this power for good. Imagine if he was another Hitler. I mean, you, you could understand, oh, I get it. When you have this charisma and you have a crowd of 72,000 people, and they're all doing what you want them to do. I mean, when he does the Radio Gaga hand claps over the head. And... He asks them to repeat after him. And they all go. do anything he says. That he could say, get up, and everybody would stand up. Nobody even thought about it. They just did it. I think Freddie was a very affectionate person. He was a very kind person. He would always come around, make sure people were okay, check in on people. He loved kids, he loved, he just liked people. And if you were a friend or family of Freddie's, then he was wonderful. And I think he felt, I genuinely think he felt like that about his fans. He was talking directly to them. And I think that they felt that. And I think that's why he had such amazing control over the audience. Even if it was just for those few moments, he absolutely loved them. And I think it was mutual. And when asked to think of a verb to describe Freddie on stage, I think of strut, like a peacock or some beautiful, rare creature just strutting across the stage. Not afraid to dominate because he knew it was for fun. The way he, he had that unique mic thing with the bit hanging down, but not on a stand. He, uh, he moved about the whole time, and that gave him the freedom. And we call him ever standing there. He, he used that, uh, that mic, that mobile mic. He was, uh, he, he was a great instinctive performer who loved to be in front of an audience. He has very good enunciation, so everyone can understand what he is saying and you can hear it a long way away. Well, this turned out to be immensely useful when Queen would do stadium gigs or beach gigs or outdoor gigs where they had tens of thousands or even over 100,000 people. In Sao Paulo, Brazil, a staggering 130,000 people attended an incredible show. By the early 80s, Queen were known as the band to see live. Those enormous gigs were, were unbelievable. 
you could see it all happening then, because that's when they were really breaking America in a big way. I still maintain that they held a big, big audience together, better than anybody I've seen before or since. There are very few people whose voices are immediately recognisable, and I think Freddie is one of them. Freddie had the most incredible voice. He had a wonderful range, he had a depth, he had a richness, and a power in it, I think, um, that meant that the songs they'd written, I, some of them I don't think anybody else could have sung. And I, I find it very interesting that there have been very few cover versions of Queen's songs, and I suspect they frighten people because it would be very hard to copy what Freddie did. Several of the great singers of all time consciously use their voices as an instrument. Frank Sinatra, for example, learned to use his voice from listening to Tommy Dorsey, who was the leader of the band that he was in in 1940. I long to kiss you, but I would not dare. I'm so afraid that you may vanish. And he noticed that Dorsey, a trombone player, had great breath control, which enabled him to draw out long notes. And he wanted to draw out long notes in singing, so he learned breath control. And Freddie could do the same thing because he realized his voice was like an instrument. Freddie was extremely interested in people who had power. Liza Minnelli was an obvious influence. Her style of belting, he loved a belter. The ultimate, of course, was Montserrat Caballé. And uh, I went to the Covent Garden Opera House to see a recital by Montserrat Caballé, the great Spanish diva. And I looked to my left, and not far away, there's Freddie in a box seat. And he's going, <laughs> and he's so excited. He's like a schoolboy. He's thrilled to be in the presence of this woman whose voice he loved. Well, it was no surprise to me at all that he shortly thereafter recorded with her, because he was into it. Let the songs begin. Let the music play. He loved the way that this woman, who did not look glamorous, could become a glamorous character strictly through the use of her voice and her attitude. This was Freddie par excellence. By the time Live Aid came around, I had small children and we had a summer function in the school hall where we were all sitting on tiny chairs um, and Live Aid was on and we thought we wouldn't get anybody there if we didn't have a television. So we had a television on with Live Aid on and when Queen came on everybody stopped whatever they were doing and watched them and I have to confess I did shed a little tear because they were so amazing. Ready at Live Aid is probably the best domination of an audience I've ever seen. They were looking around saying, well, they've done it, haven't they? You know, it was extraordinary. They're stealing the show. 
all the artists backstage who had, of course, their own egos, um, their own sense of pride. They're stealing the show. <laughs> and they were. Shivers down my spine, body's aching all the time. And you hear the audience going completely nuts. And you see on the monitor Freddie doing this impromptu duet with a BBC cameraman. And everybody said they stole the show. It just proved that they were undoubtedly one of the best live bands there's ever been. Certainly, it was a great performance. It was a great performance. Queen really did uh, rule the world for a short period. One shot, I did actually quite a lot of pictures, but one of them was them topless, looking like, well, just looking like English schoolgirls, really. And, <laughs> and actually, they picked up, as a result of the photos, they picked up a bit of publicity from, I remember the NME, who were in the business of taking the piss, mostly out of rock and rollers back in those days. That was their thing. Interesting enough, that the, the, the sole remaining uh, weekly uh, British music paper. There used to be certainly four back in those days, but they're the only one that survived. And uh, and they did. They they uh, and then, but somebody had obviously listened to the records. I mean, say, well, look at the state of this lot, and they're pretentious, and this, that, and the other. And I remember the others three being a little bit concerned about it. And Freddie said, of course we're pretentious. I mean, we we don't give a damn. We're fabulous, and that's it. I can't think of any where that his behavior jarred at all, he's not around me. He was always very sweet uh, and, uh, and very open, in fact, with me. I mean, obviously I was an ally that he had recruited that he thought was valuable in the promulgation of the image. And, and of course, you know, I came up with a few winners for them. The national and international press did not generously receive the grand image the band portrayed. Freddie was especially in the firing line because of his extravagance. Off stage, he was an intensely private person, which led to the tabloid spewing homogenized rumors of his lifestyle and sexuality. Rarely willing to give interviews, his tumultuous relationship with journalists lasted throughout his entire career. I think people were out to get them. The media get excited about all kinds of things. I mean, it's, you can argue it's none of their bloody business, but they're going to make it their business anyway, so what are you going to do about it? Freddie, and indeed the band generally, were very single-minded uh, and also didn't necessarily suffer fools gladly. The, his very, well, the, the band and Freddie in particular, his very flamboyance, if you like, invited negative comments uh, from people who like their rock and roll to be more down and dirty. I've never been quite sure why other journalists didn't like them. There were one or two who did. I think maybe they were too intelligent and too much of a perfectionist for their own good. Um, who knows? Um, some people were incredibly rude about them. Um, at one point, I believe there was actually a blacklist of journalists they wouldn't speak to because some people, for no apparent reason, just took against them. But I think subsequently they did decide that it was quite good not to be so popular because um, they lasted an awfully long time. Back to uh, pop journalism, I suppose, but they, and pop and rock and roll seems to be, uh, they, they get too involved with themselves. Uh, you know, Rolling Stone magazine in America and oh. New Musical Express mm -hmm. in England. Absolutely. Uh, do you find that they become very condescending very after good a while? Choices, yes. yeah. Yeah. We don't take any of them very seriously, actually. Yeah. Having seen them go from the, the absolute bottom to the absolute top as regards what they think of us and, and back down again, probably. Mm. Uh, mm. We just yeah, no doubt it will go can't really take it very seriously. I mean, the, when the you're whole read... idea of, of, in, of, of having a magazine that, uh, 
pretends to write seriously about politics and rock and roll at the same time, to me, is totally absurd. Yeah, new musical express is more into nail varnish than music. <laughs> <laughs> Queen, I hope you have a, me. <laughs> I hope you no, have no, a, no, a very no. successful tour. I know it will be, and it's, it's a sellout. When I first went to Freddie's home, he was living in a flat in the Kensington area um, with his girlfriend, Mary Austin and he was still the best of friends with her till the day he died. And they had a very interesting relationship. They were just boyfriend and girlfriend. And it was a very nice little flat, but it was very small. And I remember crowding in there with them one night when we'd just come back from a gig to watch Bohemian Rhapsody on Top of the Pops and sitting on his settee watching it. And Mary was lovely. And even as she and Freddie grew apart in some ways, they became the very best of friends. And she married, she had children. But their relationship never really changed. He just had other relationships as well. Freddie met Mary Austin in 1970. She worked at Bieber, a fashionable London boutique in Kensington. Mary recalls a shy Freddie smiling and waving at her every time the band would visit. At the time, Mary was seeing fellow band member and friend, Brian May. They had met at Imperial College London. But he could tell Freddie was attracted to Mary and confessed that they'd only been on a couple of dates, pecked on the cheek, and left it there. He mustered up the courage to ask her out on a date. It was a deeply emotional attachment from the start, and five months later, they were living together. Their relationship held strong, but six years in, Mary became suspicious that Freddie was at unrest with himself. When Freddie confessed his bisexuality to her, she described it as an incredible relief. After that, he became much more comfortable with himself. He became again the confident man she had fallen in love with. Freddie and Mary never married, but they remained inseparable until the end. They lived the vows they never made. They never talked about their sexuality. And to be honest, I don't think people cared. They really didn't. Um, we knew Freddie had his girlfriend in the same way that all the others did. Um, and in later years, he had his boyfriends, but that was just Freddie. Um, and he wouldn't talk about it particularly. Nobody else talked about it. And it's hard to, do, to explain now, but I think people just accepted them for what they were, whatever that was. If he had one love of his life, which I think his will and his testament, whether that shtick score proves it, that was Mary Austin, nice girl, who was with him night and day and day and night and whatever, whatever. And she knew exactly what he was. There was nothing to hide, he didn't hide it. If he did hide it, it was the worst hider in the business, you know, what you say. Mary, I'm going out now, I'm going to the Sombrero Club in Kensington, Church Kings and whatever. So he hid it very badly, being serious ish. Yeah, love of his life. It was probably Mary Austin. I think, you know, his bisexuality was pretty much acknowledged, but that was very fashionable at the time. I mean, David had made sure that androgyny and bisexuality were extremely fashionable. So even all kinds of people that weren't the least bit gay would be running around acting like they were gay because you actually got the hottest babes that way. Um, but, but, but Freddie was living with Mary, and of course, in the end, uh, he actually left his estate to her because they were like soul brother and sister. And she, um, they were very sweet. They had this little flat, uh, well, it's an apartment, but a flat in, in London, not that far from where I had lived for the first seven years of my life on Holland Road. And I remember I used to go for cups of tea in the afternoon with Freddie, dressing gown and slippers, very domesticated. It was fairly obvious that, that there was this tension that was unresolved in him. And, and even, even in the end, because Mary came back at the end and looked after him. I mean, he, well, I saw him where he talks about Mary as being the one person in his life that he truly trusted. And, and she's, I've seen her on film talking about him having, uh, when he came out of the closet and first spoke to her about it, obviously, there was a battle going on inside of him, but I'm not, that was when he came out of the closet. But he, I know, I have pictures of the guy 
that he had, was hanging around already was someone he was having a relationship with before he finally told Mary. So he was hanging around in 74, this particular guy. Freddie would have always known he was an outsider. He didn't even have to be paranoid about it. He was an outsider. No one had ever been a pop star from Zanzibar. Also, he did not have a classic pin-up look. And from whatever year he knew he was gay, he knew he was gay, when it was not yet common for people to be out. So in a variety of ways, he was different. And to be powerful vocally was a way of just smashing through all of those layers. He might be the record business in those days, maybe today, I don't know. Should know. Was you know, it didn't matter to us. Gay, schmay, dre, gay, gay, whatever. Didn't matter. In London at that time, if you were on this particular scene, gay, straight, whatever, didn't we were like revolutionaries. And this was the time when everybody had come out of the closet. I mean, even in America, that started, the spark started at Stonewall in 69, didn't it? So, and spread from there. So we only, you're only talking 73. And, uh, and anybody, any hip young man in London was wearing a bit of schmatter. He come to see me one day to play me a record. I said, just in the studio. And he says to me, Eric, why don't you hear this? I'm the promotion man. And he puts his record on. Killer Queen. I said, love it, love it, it's gonna be it, love it. Monster, monster, gonna be it. Get blah, 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 blah. No, you haven't, Eric, you haven't listened to the lyric. I have, no, to listen again, put it on again. He's Moe Shandon in the fancy cabinet. Dabba, 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 dabba. Yeah, great. No. <clears throat> I said, it's great, Freddie's gonna be here. We get plays, don't worry, we get plays than that. We get many plays. No, he said, but no, you don't listen. I tell you, you don't have a soft out of you. Unless they may soft or you haven't. The song's about you. And me, Bobola. Killer Queen. I'm the Queen, me, I'm being Freddie. And I can't have you. You're killing and that's killing me. So I'm the key to the queen and you're killing me. And when you hear the lyric now, now let's do it again. He was right, because I had a fancy cabinet at EMI, which I kept Mary Shandon on. He keeps Mary, Mary Shandon in his fancy cabinet. Hair like Mary Antoinette. I know that, not now, look at me now, but I've got no chance. I, I used to go to Sweeney's in Beecham Place in London. Have a, I used to have, they call it a Lamar perm, because I saw Kevin Keegan shtick, long Lamar like Mary Antoinette. And he claims, and I told that story, and about three or four people have verified it, that Killer Queen was written about me. She keeps a Shonda in a pretty cabinet. Let them be cake, she says, just like Marie Antoinette. A building a remedy for Chris Job and Kennedy. And at a time of invitation, you can't take Certainly, we didn't want to talk about it publicly. Any of that, he he would he would discuss things privately, um, uh, and I could name a couple of interesting names, but I won't. That I happen to know he had relationships with, but that's not for me to discuss. That's um, I do believe, even for public figures, that there is, you know, there's an area of privacy that I may be privileged to have certain knowledge, but. If they want to talk about it, it's, it's up to them. But so I don't want people talking about all the lurid things in my youth either. It's none of their fucking business. I'm laying in my bed in the Holiday in Luxembourg about three o'clock in the morning, suddenly knock at my door. I thought it might have been the, the, something I've ordered. I thought I've ordered from the, you know, the hotel. Hello, you yeah, who's that? Eric, it's Freddie dear, Freddie dear, Freddie dear. What do you want? I just come in a minute. I'm coming up. Oh, yeah, yeah. I let him in. Blum, blum, st- As he came in, I went back as well. Well, I just laying on the bed. I'm laying on the bed. And he said, Freddie, but what's your problem? Blah, blah, blah. It's three o'clock in the morning, blah, blah. We're going to pick up at eight o'clock. We're going to plane back to London. No, no, I just, just, I want to be with you. I said, well, do, you can be with me with pleasure tomorrow on the plane, blah, blah. I'll make sure I'll sit next to you and not the other boys, you or whoever it was on the trip. No, no, I mean, now, now. I know you're not into what I like, but can I just hold your hand? I said, that's what you've got to hold in my hand, Bubba. 
Let me hold her off my hand. And in fact, he held my finger, in actual fact. I think my finger anyway. Was, I don't think of my finger, I'm not sure. No, and he held my hand. So as the nearest I got to having sex with Freddie Mercury. What probably happened with Freddie and I's closeness, more closer than Roger and, and John and Brian, is when he realised that my kind of taste in music was Sinatra, was a lady called Josephine Baker, who was, was sort of a bit more, not cam, schmamp, but outrageous, Judy Garland, you know, friend of Dorothy type shit. That sort of, he loved all that too. He loved all that. And when we spent hours talking about, oh, Eric, do you see Betty Davis movie the other night on Channel 4. No, Bob, I missed it. So we kind of, in a strange way, are very much into what they were doing and what was happening currently by other bands and artists. But he also loved time. I remember Josephine Baker, a very famous French artiste, big star. She was appearing at the um, Palladium and I got him tickets to see him. Now, not I've got tickets for that, whatever, Monday night. She was there for a week, I think. He then went himself up. Nearly every night went to see her. What occurred was, because he was so knocked out by this, seeing this lady live, and I took him, he'd heard of her, heard her records. But he bought me a little brooch, little brooch, one of the silver. And, and she used to wear Josephine Baker like a little scarf, sort of hat, sort of shtick, and don't know what it's called, it's some fashionable name, I don't know what it's called. But he, so the face was her face in gold, instead of silver. But the so, head shtick was gold with all little diamonds in. Must be worth a fortune, he bought it at Cartier for me. I think perhaps Freddie was all, always looking for love, which he found in many ways over his life. I think he was always looking for perfection, which is probably a harder thing to find. And I think he was ultimately curious. He wanted to know what was out there, to experience a lot. And he found a lot of the things he was looking for, but perhaps not all of them. I don't think Freddie Murphy wanted one person to love. He was happy. He, thought, he was happy going to certain clubs in New York, in London, in France, in Italy, Italy full of young -ish guys. He would love all that bubbler. He loved the showbiz world. He loved making those videos. He loved Dress Up the Woman. I want to break free. I want to break free. Freddie was as nice a person as you'll find in his personal life. Threw great parties, um, had nice dinners, and uh, would go out with a couple of people to clubs and consume too much of life, as we know. But uh, he really was someone who lived to the full. Any excuse there'd be a party, start of the tour, finish of the tour, the London gig, whatever, you know, the, the gold disc presentation. So, uh, and, you know, we were never gonna say no because we all loved the party too. So it was, it was great. He took to the gay scene in New York in the late 70s, like David Attenborough would take to a nature film, uh, to, to forms of wildlife. He would excitedly say, oh, look, there are some gorillas. Let's go over and talk to the gorillas. Well, Freddie was the same uh, in the clubs of New York. And he would recommend to me the clubs that he liked, which I have to say would terrify me because I've always been a kind of lifestyle tourist. Um, um, I, I would be fascinated by what was happening, but I wouldn't actually partake. But he would come back with these firsthand reports and then he, he would talk about the anvil. Of course, that's interesting. You know, that persona that he adopted, I know exactly where he got it from. He got it from the guy in the village people who used to dance at the anvil, on, because I remember going down there once with Freddie, and there was this guy be, before he did the th on up there in the gold shorts, the cap and the moustache. So interesting enough, Freddie modeled himself, what well, I think it was Glenn. What is it, Glenn something or other? Um, from the village people. That's just a straight nick. 
Freddie, but on the village people, you know? I mean, so anyone that knew anything about what the village people meant or, or what this, you know, YMCA and in the Navy, I mean, it was so, it was clear as day to anybody who was New York, LA, London, hip. But, but obviously at the time, it wasn't quite as clear to the public why they were singing about in the Navy and, and the YMCA. I mean, now, of course, everybody understands it. There was Don't Stop Me Now, which has become a very, very popular song in Britain. Don't stop me now. Don't stop me. Because I'm having a good time, having a good time. I'm shooting star leaping through the sky. And of course, to this day, Brian feels a bit uncomfortable about it because it's a celebration of Freddie's hedonistic lifestyle, which was to kill him. Freddie, over the years, got more remote. Uh, it, you see a changing lifestyle, really. And, um, and where Freddie was when you first knew him, was a, was really a, not a schizophrenic character, but he was actually personally quite a private person. He was quite shy and I don't think necessarily really comfortable with, with new people and strangers. But his other side was the flamboyant stage presence. And I think as time went on, the stage persona really took over from the, from the original individual and he, he lived this larger-than-life character all the time. So I think by the early 80s, and especially when they were spending so much time abroad uh, recording in Munich and things like that, his, his whole approach to life changed. Why haven't you done any interviews in the past few years? Because I hate them. Why? I just hate them. I've said this several times before, but um, it's uh, just a key moment in my life with Freddie and as a gay person in heaven, the nightclub, in early 1983, I had returned from the United States and I said, have you adjusted your behavior in light of the new disease? Because it had no name then. And he said with one of his flourishes, he said, darling, my attitude is fuck it. I'm doing everything with everybody. And I had that sinking feeling. There literally is a sinking feeling. I've had it twice in my life, and that was once. And I just felt at that moment, we're going to lose Fred. And I also thought that even though he's putting up this great front, probably in the back of his mind, He thinks it's too late. Because what was tremendously unfair to the first wave of people who died from HIV AIDS was that they became infected when it was not known that the virus existed. So they couldn't know that what they were doing was unsafe. They didn't know there was any risk. It's very easy uh, for people to look back on a previous era with the mores and morals of today. But we have to remember that the 70s was this incredible era of sexual expression. There was about a quarter of a century where everything was, if not safe, at least treatable. Because once you had penicillin knock syphilis on the head in the 1940s, there was no sexually transmitted disease that was going to kill you. You could get gonorrhea, but it could be treated. So in the 70s, particularly with the uh, emancipation movements, the women's liberation and the gay liberation, people were having sex like there was no tomorrow. It's easy to forget that today. And then, of course, millions paid. Now, I know that Freddie did not have a test until the late 80s and did not 
demonstrate symptoms until the second half of the 80s. But remember, there was a 10-year incubation period, on average, between infection and symptoms. So if you were to say, Freddie starts showing symptoms late 80s, if he were an average case, no guarantee that he was, but if he were an average case, he would have been infected late 70s, which makes sense with his lifestyle enthusiasms as he conveyed them to me. Um, and, and that is so cosmically, though in no way uniquely unfair, uh, that sexual experimentation should become a capital matter. No one thought that was possible. By that time, he was being pursued everywhere by paparazzi and, you know, the, the tabloids were speculating on a weekly basis, you know, every time he was seen in public. So it was that time when there were a lot of similar casualties in, in and around the music business and, and most of us knew somebody who was similarly afflicted. So you kind of, you kind of had the feeling what was going on. Uh, but he, but he wasn't, obviously wasn't made public until right near the end. Um, but clearly, he wasn't right. Um, and uh, the fact that their activities had been so so much scaled back by them made it clear that, that, that there was something wrong. Uh, regardless of what, what it was or what caused it, he was obviously not, not the same Freddy. I think most people knew that he was ill. I think nobody really knew what was wrong or how long he'd been ill or how bad it was until pretty much at the end. Freddie was one of those persons with AIDS who responded by not wishing to be seen. Uh, by the general public. It would be wrong of us not to say that, that he has been depicted in certain quarters as a sort of decadent, wild, bisexual, yeah. irresponsible lover. Yeah. So how, uh, what was actually the truth of that? Yes, that's very, that definitely makes us very angry because he was, certainly the Freddy we knew wasn't wildly promiscuous. He wasn't consumed by drugs, any of these things that people are saying. He was, he had a very responsible attitude to everyone that he was close to and he was a very generous and caring person to all the people that came through his life. And more than that, you can't ask really, you know, he, as he moved from, from a relationship to another one, he was always very, as I say, um, you know, aware of, of the effect he was having on people's lives. We all knew that there were many people. My PA died for heaven's sake. I mean, it was, it was in our homes, it was in our friendly circles. Um, and uh, it was happening with such suddenness and force that you couldn't mourn everybody as deeply as they deserved at the moment they were dying because it was just happening on such a large scale. In retrospect, whenever you think of one of these people, then you experience their passing uniquely and individually. But then, because there were so many involved, you were just trying to keep your head above water and be good to everybody. One of the, the extraordinary things about Queen and Freddie was that they had an instinctive commercial and marketing uh, nous. With Queen, and I think with Freddie's writing, it was staggering how year on year, at that time when we and the record company were expecting and waiting for the new album, knowing that the crucial thing was, is there going to be a, a, a natural big hit? That year on year, they came up with the most extraordinary, always another step of, into the unexpected, something incredibly serendipitous when you one year it was Keller Queen, the following year, of course, was Bohemian Rhapsody. 
then it was somebody to love the following year, then it was We Are The Champions. And if you, if you think about those records, which were some of the great anthems of rock, they were, every year, we, we would breathe the sigh of relief and say, oh, got another one. Freddie had certain problems, which we all know about, especially towards the end of his life. Um, and probably some of his songs were relative to what he was going through. Uh, now, for the band, it would have been very difficult, and I give them full points. Knowing that something was up, knowing that something was up that was completely outside their own circle. Because unlike the theatrical community or the gay community, the heterosexual members of Queen wouldn't know as much about it. They would just know, oh, he's not looking too good, what's up, what's happening? But because they were very much a quartet, they stood by him to the very, very end. And the very, very end, of course, is that incredibly moving video. The one thing he wanted to do was keep on working in, in the studio. Um, he was absolutely uh, uh, determined to keep on keep the group the group going and to keep working, and that that actually kept him going. You see, we uh, watched long earlier. Time. We watched earlier. Those are the days of our lives, and actually yeah. watching it was unbearably poignant just to watch it. So for you fellows to be in that. It must have been a difficult session emotionally. It's incredibly difficult. Yes, it, 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 it was hard. It was really, but we were sort of trying to support him through it. Mm. And uh, I mean, he was incredibly brave at, at, at that uh, mm. time. Obviously, he knew, you know, and, and we all knew uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, mm. but you know, that the best thing is just to get on with life mm. and to do it. And, and he did that. And I think I think he he carried on very bravely. Actually, they put out that video, and there he is. And you go, that's not Freddie. That's a spat, although he could still sing. You know, however sick he was, he could... It was like um, seeing that like, disgusting-looking, blabbery Elvis. I've seen footage of his last concert, and he looks horrible, but he sounds divine still, you know? So talent is a funny thing. It doesn't... Disease doesn't necessarily kill the talent or, you know, self-destructive behaviour. And... Um, Clearly, his talent was intact right up until the end, that last recording. Freddie says, I still love you, and it's there for all time. You know it's complete communication, straight from the heart. Uh, what a brave man. I still love you. Oh, he knew he was fucking dying. And so that, that's a heartbreaker. The singles from Innuendo are literal. The Innuendo single, which is about being written about in the press, well, of course, they were speculating about him in the press. I'm Going Slightly Mad, a direct reference to uh, having moments of disease. And The Show Must Go On, uh, which was his philosophy. And, of course, uh, those are the days of our lives. Okay, not directly intended in that case to be a summing up, but it sounds like a summing up. It sounds like a farewell. Most of the stuff I do is pretending. It's like acting, you know, so you go on stage and I pretend to be a macho man and, and all that. And then in, in my videos, you know, you go through all the different characters and then you're pretending anyway. The strange thing is I hadn't spoke to Freddie for about a year or so. But then the reports were coming through. He's got AIDS and he's dying and whatever, and he's in bed. And I phoned up his home, Holland Park, in Holland Park. And Mary answered, lovely Mary. I said, Mary, I want to come and see Freddie. She said, Eric, he would love that. He would love that. I won't say he speaks about you all the time, Eric, but you have been obviously mentioned. He sits and he talks about old times and whatever. Um, he used to call me, he used to call me Sophie. Because him and Elton John actually started this because they used to have nicknames of people. And a lot of them were girls' names. <clears throat> so I was Sophie. The reason why I was Sophie Hall with Freddie Mercury was because 
It was an old Jewish singer many years ago called Sophie Tucker. If you ever see Bette Midler, she always talks about Sophie Tucker. But one of the biggest hits she had, Sophie Tucker, was a song called My Yiddish Mama. My Yiddish Mama, I need her more than ever now. And I was Sophie Hall, because I was like, you Yiddish Mama. And she said, and she said to me, and he always talks about you, Sophie. Funny, Elton used to call me Annie, because it was Annie Hall, the movie was out at the time, but she'd be here or so later. I said, I was going to go and see him. I, I put it off. So she said, we'll come this week. I said, I can't come this week. I'll come maybe a week or so's time. And I was too late. Freddie Mercury released a statement on November 23rd confirming the world's deepest fears. He said, I wish to confirm that I have been tested HIV positive and have AIDS. I felt it correct to keep this information private to date to protect the privacy of those around me. However, the time has come now for my friends and fans around the world to know the truth. And I hope that everyone will join with me, my doctors and all those worldwide in the fight against this terrible disease. The next day, November 24th, 1991, he died. And without anybody knowing now, maybe they did see, see I mean, all the people that flowered outside his house, or Mary's house now, and yeah, Mary and Freddie's house. And I went there and I stood like in the crowd. And nobody I thought, but not that I'm recognisable anyway, nobody knows me anyway. But I remember Jesse Case put a cap on the dark glasses. And I stood there and having a little tear and watched those flowers. And I put the flowers there too. But I put my sign, you kind of miss your mate. Love Sophie. He knew what it meant. Well, it was a sad thing. I mean, how could it not be? There was a very sweet guy who died. Uh, and I know he was in a lot, because Mary told me, but he was in a lot of, he was in a lot of pain at the end. It, it was not an easy death for Freddie. He, um, but, um, but apparently he didn't complain. Apparently he was not, um, and he didn't feel sorry for himself. Um, he, um, I don't know what else he could have done because he, you know, but apparently he was in a lot of pain. When Freddie died, that was the end of Queen. There was just great sadness. Um, because you you felt that, um, like all like all the artists that that die young, uh, you say, well, what would have been? You know, what would Buddy Holly have done? You know, what would Eddie Cochran have done? Um, all of those artists that died young, Otis Redding, people like that. Uh, you think, well, what would you know? What would Freddie be doing now? Because he's the same age as me, um, a couple of months younger. So you think, well, Freddie at 65. Hmm. April 20th, 1992, just five months after Freddie's death, a tribute concert was held at Wembley Stadium in his honour to raise awareness of the disease that claimed his life. Along with the remaining members of Queen, many stars took to the stage. I think my reasons for doing the show are, are fairly selfish. I've got a very close friend who's dying at the moment, uh, battling very hard in probably the last few weeks of his life. So I think for, uh, for me, there's a very personal interest in doing this particular show. Oh, I wanted to do it straight away. You know, firstly because of Freddie Mercury, because he was such a big personality and, you know, everyone really sort of felt something for him. And despite all the glamour and razzmatazz, it will be a serious message trying to promote AIDS education on a truly global scale. Freddie Mercury may have passed, but he never gave up his crown. Even to this day, his legacy carries Queen from success to success. I'm struck by how many people on Facebook get in touch with me because I knew Freddie. People don't get in touch with me on Facebook because I knew Paul McCartney or I knew Elton John. It's a new generation that is attracted to a certain type of mentality in which Freddie is a kind of character rather than a person because of course it's been 20 years since he died so nobody under 30 has a realistic 
idea of what he was like. So he has become a myth. The statue at Montreux helps. The statue at the Dominion Theatre in London where we were Rocky was playing helps. But it's, it's incredible how he is more famous and less critically famous than when he was alive. He would love it. He would be thrilled. He would be thrilled to know that I've been asked to talk about him 20 years after his death. I still think in 50 years' time, they're playing, they will still be playing by the Rhapsody. I really do. Freddie wanted to be a great diva-esque figure, a legend. And being Freddie Mercury allowed Farrakh to be that person. What a thrill. What an achievement. I think it's great. Without Freddie, there's no queen. There's no queen schmeen seen in. There's no. There'd be a Brian May would go on and make millions of records and millions of sales. Roger Taylor would do the same, so would John Deacon. But they will never be queen. Despite relentless criticism throughout his life, Freddie's legacy has endured. He is celebrated as a brave, mold-breaking performer with one of the most recognizable voices ever to grace music. Long live the King of Queen. There's such a great star, Bubbler. Such a great star. Freddie, Mission Bubbler, really do love you. Love you. Thank you.